good. Let's go on with the presentation, Modern Standards to Improve the Security of Emails. So I invite the speakers of Lucy Mara de Sidera, Eileen Walker, and Mariska Calabrese. While they come here, once again, I want to say that Sebastián Mejía Valencia left uh, his wallet here on the table. Please, if, you, if, if, if he is here, I invite him to go to the audiovisual department. They will give you the wallet there. for having us back. It's uh, great to see everybody once again and uh, be back at one of these meetings. Uh, my name is Severin Walker. Uh, I am a former chairman at MOG and also oversee a lot of our growth and development activities. Uh, today we're going to talk about a few current email security standards uh, that MOG has helped to support over the years. Uh, with experts like uh, Mariska, you know, playing a big role in implementation and advocacy within the industry. And then Lucy Mara is going to present on why that's important um, and some new initiatives uh, within the Brazilian and Latin American region. So, first, what is MOG? A quick refresher for me as far as uh, who we are as an organization, if you're not familiar with us. So, again, MOG was founded uh, over 15 years ago. Uh, initially to help stop the spread of spam, account compromise, virus, malware, uh, the scope has expanded quite a bit over the years. DDoS, uh, uh, anti-DDoS activity, uh, a lot of mobile security, et cetera, et cetera, is now uh, part of the working group. And overall, it's industry-driven. It's volunteers from ISPs, email service providers, other communications platforms, organizations like LACNIC, all coming together to you know, work on these issues, collaborate, share knowledge, share information, test out new methodologies, et cetera. And uh, some of those are what we'll be talking about today. So currently, MOG, uh, the demographics are primarily skewed towards North American providers and uh, uh, communications platforms, as well as some European ones. Um, but these are global issues, you know, uh, things like DDoS traffic, spam and malware propagation. Uh, they don't recognize borders, typically. And so this is why we, you know, work with LACNIC and uh, uh, JPNIC and uh, other organizations to try and, and make sure that, you know, these are being addressed globally, you know, around the world. So what we do at MOG, uh, again, we, we kind of come together to work on, uh, first and foremost, best practice papers. So recommendations on how to implement the technology, how to use it, uh, observations of uh, what we've seen in the wild uh, with these attacks or new uh, uh, threat vectors. Uh, we also work with uh, position statements, so helping organizations um, like assert.br or you know, uh, an American uh, ISP uh, consortium uh, work to you know, make sure that regulations and uh, uh, legal proceedings within their own regional governments make sense and help to further anti-abuse efforts and not hinder it. We also provide a number of training and resource uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, videos and uh, speakers uh, around the world uh, as much as possible, you know, whether virtually over the past couple years or now hopefully more in person. So again, uh, we do quite a bit of work with uh, LACNIC as well as uh, AFRINIC, uh, you know, various uh, Asian uh, Pacific organizations as well, to try and make sure that these resources are made available to uh, your region, that they address the uh, issues that may be specific to this region, and that there is a two-way kind of knowledge sharing that uh, occurs there. So with that, I will once again turn it over to uh, our resident expert here <laughs> to uh, kind of cover why some of this is important, some of the work that's been going on at MOG, and uh, then we'll talk about some CERT.BR initiatives here. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mariska, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the need for SMTP security. So oh, if I could figure out how to. Oh. So 
In terms of securing our email, um, there are a lot of industry problems that stem from insecure email. That being said, 91% of cyber attacks start with email. When we look at all the email that's sent, five to 20% of emails seem to be suspicious. Um, these numbers increase over time, and what we see is on an annual pre-pandemic rate, there's a 2,370% increase to losses because of things like business email compromise. So some of the common techniques for, um, for these attacks are specifically targeted by using things like reply to spoofing, look like domains, which are domains that look to the eye to be valid or from the, the sender that you think they are, but they are not actually there. So as an example, you can see trusted.com. Sometimes, especially when, if we're not pulling down the headers or we're not actually looking to see who the sender is, this can appear to be somebody who's trusted, but in fact, they are not. More than that, we also see um, business partner spoofing. And what that is specifically is, <clears throat> is it is made to look like it's from somebody that you trust. And, um, and it's way more targeted. So it will be your CEO's name, but not a valid email address. So a lot of these attacks culminate in a link that will go ahead and take you to a website that is spoofing something that you trust. And that very specifically could be something to go ahead and take your credentials. So that's going to look like Outlook web app, or um, it, will be, it will look like Google, or um, even just a trusted website that you tend to go to and, and provide credentials for. And this specifically is something that's, that is used all the time that people fall for. And so one of the ways that you can go ahead and lessen this risk is by implementing basic security standards or protocols with the email that you're sending. So very specifically, when we think about uh, email security, authentication and stuff, we're really talking about SPF, DKIM, and DMARC. Implementing these three DNS records is highly beneficial to all organizations. So SPF is a sender policy framework. It's essentially an allow list of, of IP addresses that you authenticate as being from yourself. So you can provide a list, hey, if you get an email from my domain and it's coming from one of these IP addresses, it's actually me sending. And then you can go ahead and you can put a policy on there to give instructions as to what to do if a recipient does not receive that authentication back. So this is what an SPF record looks like. This is just something that is entered as a DNS record. And when we break it down, we can see what version of SPF the approved IPv4 and IPv6, we'll see on the next slide. Oh, I guess, um, and um, that is, are allow listed to be sending from my domain. So we can see this, and then the, at the end, you can see there's like an all switch, and that switch allows you to tell the recipient to reject or to quarantine or to allow, but to send with a warning. So DCAM are domain keys identified mail, and those specifically, they're cryptographic fingerprints or signatures that um, to the email using the private key of the sender and to DNS published domain key used by receivers. So when those two things connect, we are then able to authenticate that the email is coming from an approved sender. So when this happens, 
it goes ahead and it appends a header onto the email that shows the integrity of the content. So right here, this is uh, a DKIM record. This is what it looks like. And there are different tags and hashes that are inserted to go ahead and provide more data within that header. So we can see here, this is what a verification header looks like when it is inserted into the email before delivery. Then we're going to go ahead and get into DMARC. And DMARC is really cool because what it does is it actually goes ahead and it takes that SPF record and DKIM and it makes sure that both of those are authenticated in order to go ahead and take action. So it goes ahead and it checks to make sure that your email has passed, D or passed DKIM and it has also gone ahead and passed SPF to then go ahead and look at a DMARC record. Now, if either of those fail, your DMARC's gonna fail. So it's really important to make sure that everything, that all of your records are all up to date and everything looks good because otherwise, when these things fail, we're gonna have problems delivering our email. So this is what a DMARC record looks like. It's actually very, very simple. It's very easy to implement. And the return on investment for putting in these records are actually pretty high because what this actually does is it forces people who are receiving email to make sure that, you are, that the email that you are sending is actually from you and to prevent deliverability of emails of people who are spoofing you or pretending to be you. So what this does is it goes ahead and it sets a record that you tell the recipient how to handle email that passes DMARC or if it doesn't. And that would be for the policy. So like this one up here says quarantine and it says if a user gets an email that does not pass DMARC, go ahead and put that email into quarantine. But there, you can also go ahead and, and have a policy that is to reject, or it could be to do nothing. Um, depending upon your organization, you might have different reasons for different policies, but in this case, the top one is telling to quarantine, the second one is saying to reject. And then the RUA is specifically a mail to address that you wanna receive aggregate DMARC reporting. And what, that, what will happen there is recipients like um, ISPs will go ahead and automate a report that's generated that you can go ahead and go through to see how many different people are spoofing you. And so that can be really helpful in terms of understanding whether or not your organization is being targeted for these types of attacks. Is this something that you need to go ahead and maybe come up with new security standards for your emails to go ahead and send? So that those benefits for the DMARC reporting, we can see here what kind of data we're getting back to go ahead and, and be able to take actionable uh, movement. And with that, we're gonna go ahead and move into other mythologies and considerations. There we go. So, uh, yeah, I want to touch on just a couple other methodologies that are currently in discussion at Mogger that we've discussed recent best practices on. Um, so, first of all, secure email transport. So, we've talked about how to authenticate the domain, uh, how to verify where it's coming from, but how do we prevent things like man-in-the-middle attacks or, you know, uh, people snooping on the traffic of a protocol that is plain text, 30 plus years old and uh, you know I could have used some updating at some point. So that's where secure email transport, start TLS and Dane come in, in handy. 
we're given kind of a, a quick overview of a lot of these things because we, we want to lead up to one, what CERT BR is uh, uh, advocating for with a lot of these technologies, but also kind of give a taste of some of the training and resources available that go a lot more in depth on these uh, that are available from MOG to our members or up for discussion with our members. And then another item uh, that everyone's uh, heard about quite a bit today already, uh, and we are also big proponents of, is uh, IPv6 adoption, which on its uh, surface may not seem like an email security methodology, but with IPv6 and the you know uh, allocations and the some of the standards that are being put into place with uh, IPv6 server-to-server -server type communications, you are able to enact some more strict or DMARC policies or test uh, you know, uh, various SPF uh, uh, methodologies that maybe your legacy V4 platform, it wouldn't have been a, a, as good of an idea or your legacy customers um, you know, wouldn't have been able to support. So things like no auth, no entry. A lot of uh, V6 um, supporting platforms uh, have started that where V4 may have had a looser um, allowance for domain authentication. Uh, V6, if you want to communicate over V6, you have to have a DMARC record and it has to be verifiable. Um, pointer record requirements or even encryption requirements we've seen on some fairly large V6 email deployments. So with that, uh, like I said, I'll turn it over to Lucy and we'll uh, discuss why this is all important. Hey, good afternoon. My name is Lucy Mara. And uh, as we heard uh, from the morning uh, opening panel, uh, internet was not developed with security in mind. So uh, at the point, at the moment, the important was making it work and make sense. But uh, with, when the time it, it starts passing and uh, internet from the project turning into production, and uh, this got big, huge. We have thousands of, of uh, uh, systems in the air, networks, and all the problems is started to happen. The attacks is starting to happen. And then security became important because we needed to continue growing the internet and we needed to keep the services running. We needed uh, resilience and reliability on the services. So what uh, started to happen is that we need to evolve the standards, and the standards are starting to evolve. Uh, the community uh, we see, we are, uh, IETF, is started developing and improving these standards and including security on those standards. As we heard from my colleagues here from Mark, uh, we had some uh, important developments and. Uh, what we need to do in order to uh, reduce those attacks. We need to start implementing those standards, bringing to our network, to our implementations, our deployments, those new versions of the protocols that came in with security. So uh, some examples here, uh, we need to implement a strong encryption uh, for example, with the mandatory uh, HTTPS and STS, um, the right version of a TLS the, with the forward circuit is, is not only about implementing the protocol, but also making the right configuration, the right choice of ciphers, uh, so we have the proper security in place. Uh, we need to implement DNSSEC. DNSSEC is not only important to protection uh, of, against cache poisoning, but also it enables some technologies like uh, DAN, DAN to protect email and to protect website uh, uh, connection. So um, email security, like my, my friends here talked about, so the need, the importance of using um, SPF, DKIN, DMARC with the proper policy to accept or, or not uh, uh, an email, uh, start TLS with DIN. Um, this can protect us against uh, uh, sniffing, espionage, uh, it can help uh, increasing the, um, sorry, the um, reputation of your services, of your email, and avoiding that your service, your infrastructure got, got blacklisted. So, um, and of course, 
IP protocol, we need to think that IPv4, uh, it's basically, can, should be considered legacy now. We need to think that IPv6 is the current version of the IP protocol, and that's necessary to uh, bring more security in terms of reducing complexity of implementations of the carrier grid net, of not having the information when you need it, for example, to chase it, uh, an investigation in an incident. And so, so all those standards, the modern standards, they are there, and we need to start implementing it. And with that in mind, uh, Nick BR uh, launched last year, in November last year, an initiative called TOP, Teste os Padrões. So basically, test the standards. And um, there is a website that you can enter right now, that is top.nick.br. And there we will find uh, three tests. Um, a test to a well, website, uh, email infrastructure, and basically your network connection. So if you want to know that if your infrastructure, your, uh, your services are implementing correctly those new standards, you can go and test it. It's simple. Just put your domain there, and we will get a result. It will run these three tests uh, and it address the correct implementation based on the RFC specifications, based on operational standards recommended by international uh, entities. And uh, you will get for each test a report, a report that uh, shows you what is wrong, what is right, and when there is something wrong, how you can correct it, fix it. So there is very good pointers uh, on how to fix the problems on your network and get it better. Uh, this uh, website, this initiative was based on the, the Dutch initiative called Internet NL, uh, that from the, the Dutch uh, Internet Standards Platform. And uh, it was developed in partnership with the NL Net Labs. So all the, this all that we have here at the top of uh, NICBR came from the Internet NL. For those that have difficulties with the Portuguese language, you can go straight to the Internet NL and you will have basically the same uh, uh, options of test and uh, the same, uh, 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 I'm sorry, the breakdown of the results and the score. By the way, I was almost forgetting. When you run the test, you get a score for write, uh, you, what you have in your network. So the score comes from 0 to 100%. If you have everything in place correctly implemented, you get a 100% score. And once you have the 100% score, you are automatically included in the top Hall of Fame. And uh, you have uh, the option for the, 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 the Hall of Fame for site, for email. The champions is when you have 100% uh, on the test for both the domain uh, and, uh, I'm sorry, the website and the email test. And you also have a, a, a category that is hoster, the hospedaging. And uh, when you have that, to have the, the, the hoster uh, listed as a champion, as a, a a Hall of Fame, you, the hoster must have uh, the all domain, its own domain, to, to, twice 100% on website, and the email test, and also the customer, to twice 100%. You also need to request that it's not automatically load into uh, the website. So I invite you guys to use the resource to test your networks and see what you uh, have wrong and uh, how you can fix it. And uh, it can be also if you are a provider or service provider that can be having your name listed in the champions could be uh, a differentiator for you as a service. So uh, that's what I have to say and uh, we are open to questions. In the end of presentation, that's already, the slides are already on the, on the website. You will find a, a larger number of references of sites with information on how to properly implement those things. Thank you. Thank you very much to our three presenters.
Me gustaría entonces ahora abrir el micrófono para preguntas de... I would like to open the microphone for questions. Good afternoon. I'm Johalin Chavez. I'm part of Supergiros in Cali. My question is the following. In part, this was already responded by what you told us. But if, as an organization, you have the mail server in Gmail or in Microsoft, and you assume that these measures should have been adopted for the domain or your email or for other services, how can you visualize these control measures that have been implemented or adopted? And how do you assess the current reputation of that service, for example, your email? Hello. <laughs> OK. So you are still in control of your own DNS records. So even if you are using another um, party to go ahead and manage your mail, you are still, you own your DNS records. And a real easy way, like there's um, a lot of uh, different validation services like um, MX Toolbox, um, that's a, you can go ahead and you can plug your domain in and the, they go ahead and um, list all of your DNS records for you. Um, another easy way, you go into your DNS provider uh, portal and you can normally go ahead and pull down um, each type of record and visualize what records you have for that domain. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is Jorge Varela from Truxco, and I have a small question. I, I hope you can uh, get introduced for that. Uh, what do you recommend to ISP to get close to Mo and all the group? Sure. So, um, we, yeah, so first and foremost, uh, Mog was founded by ISPs, right? And mostly North American, European, but now. We have Brazilian ISPs, we have Japanese ISPs. Um, my recommendation to get involved is, you know, reach out to us. Uh, I do have uh, contact cards I, I can provide. Um, we'll invite you as a guest. You know, I, I, we're very much interested in, in bringing in whomever, you know, we, we can to kind of join and participate in the conversation. The, the more voices we have, the more global diversity we have, uh, the better. Uh, you know, you just end up with better solutions that way instead of, you know, the same ISPs or the same mail platforms talking about the problems again and again. So, good yeah. question. Thank you. Una más, adelante. One more, go ahead. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Diego Sanchez. I am part of a team at my company and we work uh, repelling these attacks uh, of uh, uh, mainly through phishing and emails. And I wanted to be very specific with this. What other mechanisms, security mechanisms do you have in addition to what we discussed, the Kim, SPF, and DMARC, probably the gray list or the LVLs? Because at an organization level, we are always required to implement a, midway, a gateway to control contents and to be able to control the reputation of senders, for instance. But what other mechanisms can you have? And even at the level, a more at a residential level, what solutions could we implement to be able to protect from these issues? Because it is very common to receive phishing, to receive spam. Now, when the account uh, is uh, uh, attacked once that happened in addition so um, uh, if we can use uh, uh, encryptation uh, what other what could we use the data loss prevention among others that's my question uh, so, yeah uh, there's a, a quite a bit of a response I don't think we have a uh, time to cover everything but I, I, I will summarize it like this um, what we are recommending and, and what their service, the, the top uh, uh, platform is verifying, will help with a lot of the exact domain or the, the uh, misuse of your domain or the misuse of your mail platform. From there, 
look at your data, look at your logs on your MTA, look at your authentication uh, attempts, et cetera, et cetera, and, and start combining all of this to you know, kind of build your own kind of net to catch the, the phishing or the, the, you know, the bad traffic, so to speak. Um, a lot of ISPs or a lot of communications platforms are sitting on the solution and, and they may not even know it yet as far as detecting account compromise or, or preventing phishing attacks. So um, the other thing, again, I, I'll advocate for organizations like LACNIC, like MOG, and uh, APWG is another great organization where knowledge sharing is key, right? So if I'm looking at my own logs and I, I see you know, uh, another uh, platform attacking us, they should probably be aware that they're sending that traffic and they probably want to be aware of uh, you know, that traffic coming across. So how do we make that connection and how do we share that data? A lot of times that's brokered through these uh, nonprofit working groups or these industry consortiums. So getting involved in the industry is very much key to that as well. I would like to add one thing, which is I think that in terms of sharing data, I think educating your users um, for what to look for is also like really effective. When they receive an email to make sure it's from somebody that they trust all the time, 